Okay, so I'm going to uh, take a minute and talk about some of our, our dust or particulate matter data. And as with, um, you know, as with our gas concentrations, there's a lot of factors that, that do affect dust and particulate matter in the barns. Um, and we did take measurements on a number of these things, and what we found was there was a slight increase in uh, particulate matter concentration as the size and the number of animals increased in the barn, but really most of these factors didn't have a strong correlation to the, the particulate matter concentrations in the barn, um, with the exception of, of the bedding. And so that's what we're going to, to talk about here. Um, Aaron did mention that we, we measure particulate matter two different ways. And, and in one of the pack barns, we did some intensive measurements where we tried to look at the difference between particulate matter during what we'll call just hours of normal operation, um, a 24-hour period when they were not bedding the livestock, and then during a three-hour period when they were bedding the livestock, and, and compare those particulate matter concentrations. And so what we found, um, again, this is one, just one of our pack barns, that um, our, our total suspended particulates um, during hours of routine operation compared to the, the bedding events, obviously much, much higher during a bedding event. Uh, and we see the same thing for the, the PM 2.5 and the particulate matter 10 compared to the, the bedding events. The good news is those bedding events are very short-lived, and, um, and the, the concentration of the, of the dust in the barns very quickly returns to, to this level um, following you know, a bedding event is done within a couple hours. Um, and so we, we did also take some, some measurements now in the scrape barns, again, because of the, the difference in how we measured them. We, we didn't get the total, um, the total suspended particulate, but we did have the, the PM 2.5 and the PM 10. And again, in our scrape barns, um, we measured that over random 24-hour periods. And so that could include a bedding event and just routine operation. And so I would expect um, these values to fall between our, our routine operation and our bedding event our values, and they do, so, so that was nice to see. Um, and then we compared this to some published data from open feedlots. And during routine operation or even during a 24-hour period that includes bedding events, the, the concentration of particulate matters in these monoslope barns is, is lower than what has been reported in open, in open feedlots. And the exception to that, of course, would be then during the bedding events when we do have a higher concentration of, of the dust. So what does all this mean again for the, the guy that's out there or the gal that's out there in the bar? Um, we do see variability um, in the pack systems for our gas production, particularly for the hydrogen sulfide. Um, a little bit more variability in the pack systems compared to the scrape systems. Um, our, our largest influence of temperature was on hydrogen sulfide, and that did seem to have more of an influence in the pack barns compared to the scrape barns. Um, we do see a, an effect of time of day um, with those peaks occurring at you know, 7 to 8 in the morning and 7 to 8 at night. Um, we have very relatively low particular matter concentrations in these barns. And um, you know, again, with the exception of, of short periods of elevated dust during those bedding events, but those do quickly return to those lower concentrations. that we want to share here is, is the emission data. Now, when we start looking at this emission data, remember what we're going to show you is that range between the net emission and the gross emission for these different facilities. When we looked at it, at the data though, one of the biggest, um, biggest factors that we saw affecting, affecting our, our relative numbers were that, was that curtain position. You know, when we close up those curtains, have a lot less airflow, we saw quite different emission numbers. But everybody manages their barn slightly differently, right? People have, a, have those curtains open for different amounts of time over the course of a year. And so what we want to show is that how some of these factors then affect the numbers. You know, we want to show what factors have a, have a, have a real driving influence on changing those numbers. Because we feel that that's, that's where we need to go, is we need to start identifying how these different factors affect it so that as a producer or as someone who's working with producers, you know, you can account for as many of those factors as you can when you're trying to figure out an annual emission rate, for example, or come up with some other evaluations on air quality. So what I'm going to show is some conditions for open curtain and closed curtain condition, and then you're also going to 
going to see uh, everything as a bar, like this. This is our, our range of ammonia emissions from, from the four, four different facilities that we monitored, again, under open curtain conditions, closed curtain conditions. Now, I provided the emission in terms of kilograms per headspace per day on this axis and the equivalent in pounds per headspace per day on the right here. Again, what the biggest difference we saw was between those open curtain conditions, low, low, uh, closed curtain conditions, and for ammonia, where we didn't see a, a huge influence of, of temperature, this is, would be attributed to that, to that airflow effect. Uh, for the scrape systems, our ammonia emission uh, ranged from, kind of take about the midpoint of these, of these bars, we're looking at about 0 0.07, uh, 0 .0, 0.1 pounds per headspace per day. With the PAC systems, uh, we have some larger bars. We also have a lot more variability in the air quality in these barns. And that would, on average, be around uh, 0.15 pounds per headspace per day. Closed current conditions for all four systems uh, lowered considerably in, the, let's say, on average, about uh, 0 0.02, 0 0.03 pounds per headspace per day. On hydrogen sulfide, kind of mirrors what we saw with the concentration data, right? We saw some, some lower, uh, lower numbers for the scrape systems, around 0 0.003 pounds per headspace per day, and then um, fairly negligible with closed current conditions. On the PAC systems, the numbers were higher, closer to um, 0 0.015 pounds per headspace per day, and again, dropped considerably with the PAC system. Now, with hydrogen sulfide, we did see an influence of temperature. So these lower numbers for the closed system and the packed system, with the, uh, these lower numbers with the closed uh, curtain conditions, partly because of airflow, but then also because of that reduction in temperature. And so we, figured, we found that there were lower emissions under closed curtain conditions, combination of temperature and then the airspeed and airflow effects of having that curtain, uh, with that curtain position. We did see some higher variability in those emissions with the PAC system, which echoes what we saw with the concentration data. And again, we just we feel that we have these emission numbers, but we really can look to those concentration data as well to look at the relationships with animal activity. You know, those peaks that were, would occur throughout the day for constant air speed um, and temperature. Now, does this all mean? What does this all mean? Does this mean that we should keep the curtain closed all the time? Uh, does it mean that you know we should have a scrape system versus a pack system? Well, we always kind of bring that question back to our heads: is, Are we doing it right? Well, we know that the air quality aspect in these barns is only a piece of the puzzle, right? This is only a portion or a, a tiny bit of those of, of all those decisions that you have to make from a cattle comfort economic standpoint. You know, we know air quality is only a piece of that. We just hope that by understanding how these factors affect. Um, the air quality in these barns, that it just helps you make a more informed decision. So then that brings us to, to what's next. Well, with any, uh, with any research project, you're always then trying to figure out, well, what are, we gonna, what are we gonna do next? Well, what's next for us is that, you know, with the research that we've collected through this project and a lot of the research that you're gonna hear throughout the rest of today, we wanna be able to pull that together and say, well, why do these barns do what, we, do what they do? We have, we have some theories, but we need to work through some calculations to, to really shore up those relationships. And if we can do that, if we can figure out what all those different relationships are, can we then accurately predict what's going to happen in another bar? Doing this monitoring is expensive. We don't want to have to be able to, we don't want to have to monitor at every single bar, right, to get accurate emission numbers. So we want to be able to, to make some predictions based on what we have measured in the past. And then finally, with this information, how can we positively change what happens in these farms? And so what all this culminates into is, is modeling. It's a dreaded word by many, but we feel that that's going to be the next step for us on the research side of things. So then we're going we're gonna to finish off here with a challenge to you about what's next for you. And um, obviously, where we hope that you can take this data and, and use it to help you with your short and your long-term decision-making tools. 
And whether you manage a barn right now or you're considering building one or you do consulting for folks who, who do have these barns, um, we also uh, would encourage you to, to continue to participate in, in continuing research efforts that we have. Um, certainly, we can't do this if we don't have cooperating producers. And so, you know, maybe you would consider allowing us to come out onto your barn, um, out onto your farm, take some measurements, additional measurements in your barn. Um, and again, a, a big shout out to, to the four producers that we worked at with this barn. They were, they were wonderful and um, we might have been a nuisance, but they never told us that. So, um, and then the, the second part is, there's gonna be opportunities in the future for you to be part of stakeholder committees. And um, obviously, if you're interested in that, come see Erin or I, but I, I would hope that if you are approached by, by a member of our team to be part of an advisory committee, that you would seriously consider um, giving us a little bit of your time to have some input into our research and outreach efforts. And, um, and then finally, please do not stop asking questions. This is how we advance our research forward. And, uh, and, and we appreciate all those questions that you give. And so I guess with that, we would open it up and we will entertain any questions that you might have.